All right, guys, back with another video. In this video, we're going to be talking about Octane's render settings. This video is brought to you by you guys. One of somebody here in the community, I posted a poll here asking what people wanted to see. And this guy was like, the hell with all this stuff. I don't want to see any of this. Just show me how to get a clean render out of Octane. He's like, here, everyone can make these. What we need to see is an internal Octane settings to get stable, noise-free, grain-free, lag-free, real-time performance on a tutorial version. And I'm like, dude, you're gonna need like a high-end computer, water cool and all that stuff. But anyways, I know what, what his point is. He just wants to get a good clean render. So I'm gonna show you how I've been able to achieve it. There's nothing, I'm not a master at Octane. I've been learning Octane for the last past five months and I just wanna share what I'm learning with you guys, okay? I just wanna give value. That's all I'm, I'm looking for here. The last 30 days I've been doing the Win Bow uh, Challenge. If you haven't checked out his video, take a look at it i learned a lot but i decided to always only work in octane for those 30 days so i can get to more familiar with octane and these are the settings that i was typically using to get my render so this render that i got going right here hopefully this is going to be the thumbnail for this video i make my thumbnails first for the video and then i make the video after so i was like okay you know what i was gonna you know what i'll just show them how i'm rendering out this actual thumbnail right here first thing first in my my viewport typically i run my samples at 10. here are my my render settings now the kernel type that i always use is path tracing i get it's like that's what i go to path tracing that's what cycles was for me so i use path tracing all the time max samples i'm using right now typically my baseline is 200. i'll set everything at 200 render that out if it looks like i need more samples then i'll start working my way up from 200. uh preview samples i do from anywhere from 10 to 100 depends on my viewport if i got a lot of subsurf going on I might need 10 and then if I don't really have a lot going on, I keep it really low. Now, max diffuse, glossy and scattering or scattering. These are important and they're seen. It's based on the scenes and the materials that you're using for in this scene here. I don't have a lot of crazy stuff going. So I have like set to eight glossy set to 10 and scattering depth is set to eight. Scattering is if you're using a lot of fog, subsurface, glass and stuff like that. You're going to need to crank this up. I've done one sample or one rendering where I did the gummies, these like gummy material, gummy bear things. I had to crank this thing up to 25 on the scattering at least just to get a clean render out of that. Plus the render max samples were like at a thousand, maybe 1500, okay? Based on each scene and the amount of materials and stuff that you got glowing. Then here, I just learned about this the other day, this Ray Epsilon. When you're working in small scale, like really small stuff, your shadows are gonna get kind of weird. This Ray Epsilon will fix that. Check this out. I wish I would have known this. This is not the great, greatest scene to show this off. But when I was making these little screw bolts in one of my dailies, uh, I had the shadow issue. Like I was like, man, the shadows look so heavy and so strong. This Ray Epsilon, if I come over here and I tweak it, put it to 100. Boom. Look at the shadow. Super hard, right? Hold down shift and I'm just going to slowly down it. And then look at, the, look at the shadows now. The shadows are totally like wigging out but if you're working at a super small scale you're going to need to bring this ray epsilon value down okay so that's just something i've learned here a couple of days ago i'm going to set that back to default because this scene was built at real scale another number one tip that i read from octane always work at real world scale again this even in this thumbnail here i have my guy set up here right this is a six foot soft box and then these are like you know the size of a computer screen and then this is like the desk here right i'm trying to keep everything in real world scale it makes everything the lights the rendering everything works better uh, for example this is a six foot soft box and it's only running at 200 watts i had one of my first daily renders i did the actual object was like three meters large my lighting values were like at 30,000. It was like crazy because it was like, it's a massive object, right? I'm like trying to light a building or something, right? So these numbers were off. The render took a long time and it just because the massive scale of everything was keep your objects at real world scale. It really helps your lighting and your rendering too. So that's it for your Ray Epsilon. Take a note on that. Keep that in mind. I don't know what this filter size is. I don't mess with it. I keep it at stock. Once I learn about it, I'll tweak with it. Next one would be GI clamp. Typically, the GI clamp is set to 1 million. All the all the Cinema 4D guys I watch, they immediately throw this down to 1 when they're working in their viewport. And some even render at 1. But I typically keep it at 10. And then in my viewport, when I'm working on it, I do put it at 1. So again, this is to reduce those fireflies when you get those little white specks. If you got a lot of those, you need to crank this number up and it'll help reduce those, okay? And then that's pretty much it as far as the samples and stuff go that, that I keep here, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and, oh, adaptive sampling. I forgot about this one, important. When I'm working in the viewport, I tend to turn this off because it helps it, it helps reduce my lag in my screen. But when I'm done, I set it to 
to on. As far as I know, the adaptive sampling, this doesn't really give us justify, but from one of the videos I watched, like say you have a lot of glass in one scene and then your, your background is fairly minimal. It will render enough samples to get the background clean and then focus all the samples onto the actual glass or where it really needs a, extra, a lot of extra samples. So it's just adapting where it's putting the samples at. And then here, it's a minimum adaptive sampling, meaning it's going to render up to 150 samples before it even turns on, right? This is defaulted to 256. So I always do everything at 200 and never turns on, right? So that's why I've knocked mine down to 150. Sometimes I even knock it down to 100. It depends on, it all depends on the scene. I like all these numbers are always fluctuating. They never stay the same. But in this case, 150, it turns on at 150 and it got 50 samples I can do. But this is not a heavy scene, okay? So adaptive sampling. I'm going to go ahead and leave all my settings here. And I'm going to quickly go ahead and just render out my scene here and see how long it takes. And then we'll compare it to the stock settings. I'll set all these numbers back to default and we'll see what it looks like then. All right, boom. So it's finished here. My render settings and all my settings, it set, uh, it took basically one minute and 41 seconds. Now there was one thing I forgot to mention that I do have running in the background. If we go to my compositing scene, I actually do have this on here. Uh, I render with this denoiser, just in standard denoiser. I pipe it in here and then I got a lens distortion, but I have that turned off. So basically with this lens distortion on, it was on, but I turned it off before, uh, after the, I showed you guys the render. It took one minute and 41 seconds. Okay, not bad. Again, if I was going for an animation, definitely not good. I would try to reduce this and get my settings way lower. But then in a single image still, one minute and 45 seconds. Now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make this full screen. I'm going to go ahead and set this to default. I'm going to hit default, 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 GI clamp default. And then I'm going to turn, uh, I think this is set off. Yeah, that's off by default. Okay, turn that off. There it is. So now we got 500 max samples, 8, 24, 8, 1 million on the GI clamp. I'm going to render it out here and then I'm going to set this to slot one and then we're going to see what the difference is. All right, guys. So boom, it's finished at the stock settings with all those stock numbers. It took four minutes and seven seconds. OK, that's a huge it, it almost basically double. Right. But let's compare the difference. Let's look at the difference here. Slot one that was at 500 samples. Slot two that was at two, 200 samples. One, two, one, two. I can't tell the difference, guys. Slot one at 500 samples took four minutes and seven seconds and the file size is 175 megabytes and then we go to mine slot two one minute 41 seconds 248 megabytes interesting i don't know why mine was more megabytes than the other one i think because of the denoiser i don't really know but it was shorter a lot shorter let's zoom in so this is mine at 200 samples this is stock 400 samples all we can see a little bit of noise there too but also i do see a little bit more detail look at the edge, the sharpness of this line here and this this right here and then we go to the denoiser that denoiser we know tends to soften things up a little bit right so but when we zoom out to full scale like i really don't notice the difference if you want to wait the extra two minutes that's you right <laughs> now again this is scene it's scene to scene is every scene is going to be different depending on the materials i'm using if i got a lot of subsurf going on a lot of fog you're going to have to crank those numbers up it's always going to be different it's never going to be the same again my system that i'm using i don't have a crazy system here i'm using just a standard laptop i have a a core i5 inside here i have a nvidia uh gpu 10 some 10 something ti gtx it's an old card matter of fact i can figure out exactly what card i have here let me show you this is another thing if you did not know if you scroll down here to the bottom and then you click on octane show octane viewport this is the octane render system right the little viewport let me go ahead and turn on the render it's the only way it works if you turn on the render and then i click back on the octane viewport boom here it is now it shows you like this is what octane says you got all these extra little settings here i can stop the render i can pause the render uh all this stuff here i've never used but this is another option that you can if you have want to have this running but if you look down here it actually gives me some data here's i'm using a nvidia G geforce gtx 1050 ti and that's a four gig hard drive four gig one right now this i, I do pay attention here because if i'm starting to use a lot of 4k maps and stuff and i have a lot of image maps in my in my materials this will slowly rise up right right now i do have a lot of uh i'm running about 
three image maps for these this uh, roughness and stuff like that so that's why i've been kind of experimenting with procedural stuff because my numbers get way lower and it helps your render times and it's a little bit more faster but if this is something you want to play with you can definitely take a look at this again it's something i never really use but it is there that is the octane uh viewport there okay if you're new to blender and this is something new to blender octane for you take a look at this video here because it's going to run through the materials all the materials and how to set up materials because materials are important and this when you know what samples you're going to need more for certain materials and things like that take a look at that it'll run you through all the materials hope you guys enjoy patrick lavar keep rendering peace